how crucial trust is, togetherness is, cooperation is for us humans. There is a, one anthropologist by the name of Margaret Mead, very celebrated um, anthropologist. And anthropologists are people who study tribes and tribal behaviors to unfold human evolution, right? So once there was a press conference, which was headed by Margaret Mead, and uh, somebody asked her a question that what, according to you, is a turning point in the history of mankind? Thank you, Dr. Abdal. I really appreciate your switching on the camera without even requesting for that. Thank you. And uh, everybody thought that when you ask a question about human history and um, figuring out what has been the turning point. So, you know, people thought that she would answer something like uh, invention of fire or discovery of wheel. But to everybody's utter surprise, she said, none of the two. She said, for me, the biggest turning, pro uh, turning point in the history of mankind was when we discovered a healed fibula bone while excavating on a site. To discover a healed fibula, or for a fibula, you know, it's one of the tallest, or rather, our longest bone in our body, uh, which uh, connects the hip joint with that of the knee. And it's very crucial for this bone to be uh, hale and healthy for us to work. Uh, she said, the site of the excavation belonged to the era when we were hunter-gatherers and we were not really staying in one place for a long period of time. And a fibula gets hurt. Nobody can walk, right? right? Um, so somebody either would have waited for this person, for him to get healed, or somebody must have piggybacked this person. They must have held this person on their back for the fibula to heal, which means that we transformed from being animals to social animals, right? That is uh, the starting of, that is the beginning of a new era in the evolution of mankind. That is our capacity to feel empathy towards fellow beings to understand their pain, to know that we can contribute to someone's healing, right? And we can compromise on our own comfort in order to comfort someone else. So trust is one of the strongest bonds that can exist between two human beings. And trust needs investment. It cannot happen overnight. By nature, we are judgmental people, okay? By nature, we are little skeptical people. Um, it takes about, uh, you know, 30 seconds for us to judge someone, like whether this person seems like a friend or a foe. Again, you know, this goes back to our evolutionary roots. It's not, I mean, if you just trust someone and it so happens that this person is not really worthy of it, we have to pay the price for the same, right? So many of us, we have been bitten uh, once or twice in our relationships. Uh, somebody would have betrayed us in the past. So what gotten hurt then was our trust. And we all know it that if once our trust gets uh, compromised, it's difficult. We tend to overgeneralize that experience on other people as well, right? So I'm going to talk about uh, trust majorly in the work setup, in the professional setup, what it takes uh, to create that trust, right? What kind of environment and culture we need in order to uh, create that safe surroundings that human beings can see each other more as supporters, more as uh, people who are going to contribute to each other's growth and development rather than being uh, being being the ones who are more like creating problems for you right give me a moment please oh. 
Okay. Allow me to share my screen. So building trust and respect. Let's start with a small story. This is a story that I've taken from Panchatantra. So there was a field in which four oxen dwelt. There lived four oxen in a field. And a lion used to prowl about that field uh, because oxen mates make a uh, very good uh, prey for the lion. Now, many a time he tried to attack them, but whenever he came near, they turned their tails towards one another so that whichever way the lion approached them, he was met by the horns of one of them. So unity is strength. We have heard it many times. At last, however, they fell quarreling with each other and went off to the pastures alone in the separate corners of the field. Then the lion attacked them one by one and soon made an end of all four, right? So what I'm trying to say is that uh, in an organization, when we are together, we are safe. There are a lot of dangers outside the organization. Competition, right? Uh, fishing, people eyeing your brand, people eyeing your processes. So there is, there are a lot of dangers lurking outside us. Let's just ensure that within the organization, we create a safety circle where everybody feels comfortable being themselves. And that can only happen when we join hands and we be with each other. Now, what is trust? It is defined as confidence, faith or hope that we have in someone or something. Trust is our capacity to be vulnerable in front of someone and expecting that they will responsibly care for an important interest of ours, right? So when you trust someone, you very carefully deposit your feelings your uh, secrets, your vulnerabilities with someone, right? And you have this surety that this person is going to take care of what you have deposited with this person in a responsible manner, right? So, kuch bhi kare, kisi ka trust nahi tori, right? Because, you know, that leads to some indelible marks, unhealable wounds in that person. And that actually changes the perspective of an individual towards life, towards people, towards future. Okay, so let's be safe caretakers and trustees of anything, any vulnerability that somebody shares with us. Now, I just talked about the circle of safety, right? Now, how does that circle of safety gets created? It gets created when we all care for each other and we are bothered about each other's well-being, right? When we protect each other's vulnerabilities, as I shared, right? When we extend support to someone who is going through a rough patch in their lives, when we appreciate each other's and we celebrate others' wins. Also, one feels safe within an organization when there is a feeling of belongingness, right? When we feel that we are a part of the organization, we have a sense of ownership towards the organization. Also, 
you know, uh, we feel protected, right? We feel we feel safe in the presence of our colleagues, our seniors and subordinates. I know it might be sounding like utopian dream to somebody, like how can you feel safe in the presence of your uh, bosses or your colleagues who most of the times are just waiting for an opportunity to show you down, isn't it? That is a kind of culture also we have experienced in certain organization. So nobody feels safe in that organization. We are always in a survival mode in that organization. And yesterday when we talked about stress, you know, it's a complete perceived threat in that organization. Cortisol levels will always be high and we will either be in fight or flight mode. It's a very um, unpleasant vibe that gets created when people don't protect each other's uh, well-being within an organization, right? So safety will only be experienced with the presence of human elements in the organization. And there are enough threats outside us. Correct? Now, what is circle of safety? See, when there is a feeling of safety within the organization, we feel we belong to that organization, right? There is a sense of ownership towards that organization. Within safety, uh, there is there happens to be growth because you can actually work upon higher order variables rather than just protecting your physical or psychological selves. There is also a lot of alignment between what you say and what you do, right? There is interpersonal alignment as well. When you experience that your organization is providing you a space where you can be your selves, right? How can we create that circle of safety? We feel valued by our colleagues and we feel cared by our supervisors. There are many of you who would say, no, this doesn't happen in our organization, right? Um, I would say, be the element of change, okay? In the sense that you can be caring about your subordinates and every time a superior brings about a change in their attitude or perspective, it cascades down to all the lower rungs in the organization. We become absolutely confident that the leaders of the organization and those with whom we work are there for us and will do what they can to help us succeed. Isn't it? There is a sense of social support. And I hope you remember this variable from my previous uh, session with all of you, how much we need a sense of support when we are going through difficult times in our lives. We become members of a group and we feel as if we belong. It creates an environment for free exchange of information and effective communication. And it is fundamental for driving innovation. See, when our basic psychological needs are met because of the presence of other people who are caring, who are supportive, right? We start investing into higher order goals in our lives. We contribute more to our organization because we don't have to expel a lot of energy protecting ourselves in that setup, right? So we start utilizing our energy and harnessing our energy to create more opportunities for self, right? And this equips the organization to defend itself from outside dangers and sees a lot of professional opportunities. So imagine bringing in some small human elementary changes in the organization can completely change the vibe of the organization. You feel protected, you feel loved, cared. And as a result of that, you can actually start working to uh, make your organization and yourself grow. And what does absence of safety look like? This is what absence of safety look like when there's a lot of politics within the organization, when there is dog eat dog mentality, right? When there is crab mentality, when every penny is pulling the other person down, right? When you are threatened and intimidated for making small mistakes, all right? When you're isolated, shamed, rejected, right? You're criticized and there is a threat of layoff. 
right? When COVID happens, you know, many of us, we felt that there is a threat or a danger on the security of our jobs, right? When your performance is uh, being very closely monitored and you're ticked for small little things and criticism comes very handy as a tool, as a correctional tool by the superiors, that creates a situation or that creates a feeling of uh, absence of safety, right? That generates cynicism, okay? And uh, this is the time when everybody is just bothered about their own personal interest. And the whole purpose of maintaining the circle of safety is that we can invest our time and energy to guard against the dangers outside us. See, there are enough dangers um, outside the organization, hankering us, wanting to get us, right? And imagine we, because of our own insecurities or egos, right or maybe our yeah, past experiences and uh, personalities we create the same threats within the organization as well so please have a look when you compare a uh, circle of safety with absence of circle of safety when when there is a circle of safety people feel safe they focus on organizational interests and are united against external threats and opportunities when people uh, do not experience that circle of safety, they feel threatened, focus on self-preservation. You know, this is when egocentricism takes over. This is when my interest becomes my priority and I stop caring about people, organization, um, and other things around me. And this is when the organization becomes very weak, right? And remember, uh, a chain is as strong as the weakest link. Even if there are one or two people in an organization who are wanting to disrupt the culture, they may get successful when others give into their cynicism and um, their vengeance and their negativity. Let's hear Sinek Simon, right? One of the contemporary thought leaders who talks about uh, building up a circle of safety in an organization for each one us to be able to thrive at our workplace. Please let me know if you could hear. Uh, sorry. Is it audible? Ma'am, the video is not audible. Audible. Can you? Can anybody help me? Can you tell me? Is there any special thing we need to do? Uh, Ma'am, actually, it's. Uh, uh, do you have this video somewhere else on your system? Just a second. Sorry, Manisha, did you say something? Uh, Ma'am, I was saying, do you have this video on your system? Uh. Let me check again. Just a second. Let me give it a try again. What is a circle of safety? Why audible, now? Audible, ma'am. No, audible, ma'am. Great. So the outside world is fraught with danger. Things that were in caveman times, it would have been you know, saber tooth tiger or the weather or lack of resources, you know, things that are trying to eat your life. You know? Well, in the modern business world, Things that are trying to kill you, quote unquote, are the unpredictable nature of the stock market or a new technology that shows up out of nowhere and renders your business model useless. Or your competition, who may want to actually put you out of business, or maybe they just want to steal your customers or deny you customers. You know, um, These are all pressures that, if not uh, if left unchecked, will, will kill you, will put you out of business. Right? These are a constant. 
is the danger of the outside world. The, the, the dangers inside an organization are a variable. Um, and a circle of safety is something that leaders provide. They, they draw a circle of safety around their people. And they say, um, if I keep you safe internally, and you do not fear any dangers internally, then you are more likely to work together, trust each other, cooperate, to face the dangers externally. And only when there's a strong circle of safety, their innovation. Innovation requires risk and experimentation and failure. And if people fear they might lose their jobs simply because they tried and failed or lost some money, then they won't try. So there is no innovation. Um, this is the joke that so many organizations pound people and say, if you come up with something big, we'll give you a big bonus. But if you fail, we'll fire you. Or even if that risk exists, they are destroying innovation in their company. The responsibility of leadership is two things. To decide uh, how porous that circle of safety is, in other words, who should we let in? We can only let in people that we want to trust and that we, that would trust us. In other words, people who believe what we believe and share our values. In, right? You, if you let in someone just because they're qualified but they don't share your values, they're like cancer. They'll destroy it. That's number one. The other thing is how big to make the circle. Some leaders make the circle of safety only around themselves and their board and their senior executives. They're the safe ones, but everybody else can fend for themselves. In fact, worse, they'll sacrifice everybody else to keep themselves safe. These are very weak organizations. Um, the strongest organizations, the leaders extend that circle of safety right to the most junior people. And they insist on the bureaucracy that each layer of bureaucracy protect them with the layer beneath it. And this is effective bureaucracy. This is what leadership is supposed to do. Um, and what you find is, like I said, when the circle of safety is strong and people come to work and feel safe, um, they naturally, naturally cooperate and trust each other, face the dangers externally, and seize the opportunity. When they have to invest any more than the minimum, you know, in any energy, protect themselves internally, they're taking away the energy that they could be applying. That's why great organizations are the ones where they just convince their people. So, it's the responsibility of the leaders, it's the responsibility of the superiors to create an environment where people feel safe or else be ready to lose them, as simple as that, or be ready to face the politics and all those uh, unpleasant, tricky things in your organization, right? Okay, here is a small self-assessment. You can all, um, I'm giving you five minutes, right? Pick up your pens and papers, and just write a yes or no to these uh, eight statements to know whether you are building a trust culture in your organization or there are certain gaps. Okay, so next five minutes, start reading the questions or the statements one by one and follow them up with either yes or no as an answer and higher the score, greater your capacity to build up a culture of trust. Honestly, everybody, find out if you are building a culture of trust.
Do let me know once you are done. Okay. So, higher the score, better your capacity. Ma'am, it was not uh, properly visible to some of the participants, ma'am. Is it visible to you, Manisha? Ma'am, actually, the font is a bit small. Can we just increase the size oh. of... Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Is it better? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I hope you would have gotten by, uh, got your scores by now. And if you want, you can please keep a, a screenshot of this particular slide to see whichever areas you've got a no at, right? To whichever statements you've written a no, those are the areas that you need to work upon to strengthen your capacity to build up a culture of trust in your organization, right? And it's very, very important. See. We are spending about eight, nine hours of our days in, in our workplace, right? Imagine what difference it can create to our lives, to our health, to our uh, mindset. If we are working in a place that is offering us a little bit of autonomy and a sense of security and a sense of safety and how sacred it is that we as humans or in the capacities that we are working in, we have this opportunity to give the sense of security to people around us, right? So let's start making lives easy for other people. This is the least, this is our legacy actually, which we are going to, which we are going to leave behind. We will never ever be remembered for what we have taken. We will always be remembered for what we have given to this world, right? So least we can share and give to people around us a sense of trust and sense of security. OK, now, uh, why must people trust you? There has to be something in you for somebody to be able to trust you. And also, these are the parameters that we are always looking for to decide whether the, uh, the person is trustworthy or not. OK, so there is something called as cognitive trust and there is something called as affective trust. Cognitive trust comes from the fact that someone can have some thinking capacity, some skill set, a mindset because of which you are able to trust that person. And affect is a word for emotions, right? Which means that there are some people who makes you feel so comfortable, so wanted and loved that it is easy for you to trust these people, right? So cognitive trust comes from two things. One is capability. When you know that you have uh, delegated a task to someone, right? And this person has the capacity 
to finish that task. He has the knowledge, he has the skill set or the competence that the task will be accomplished. You are able to trust this person. Isn't it? And these are the people who are actually a delight to work with. The other, uh, I would say, variable which allows somebody to trust another individual is consistency of behavior. I, I mean, reliability. When somebody is predictable, right? And when, when you can actually fall back on this person because you have his back, because this person has always shown up, isn't it? This person is very responsible when it comes to um, contributing to the organization or to a mission or to a task, right? So if you want to be trusted in your organization, please be somebody who is knowledgeable, who is capable, right? Who is competent enough so that other person can rely on you and search for such people. If you want to have, you know, kind of uh, develop a sense of uh, team, team sense with someone, a group affinity with someone, these are the people to look for. People who are reliable, consistent, people who have the knowledge or the capacity to stand up to the occasion and somehow they have the resources to get you through that situation. And there are other people with whom, with whom we can or to whom we can trust because, you know, they really make you feel very comfortable. They accept you non-judgmentally, right? And you can very safely deposit your vulnerabilities with such people. So one of the tendencies in these people who exude effective trust is called care. They're very warm. They're empathetic, right? And uh, they're sensitive to other person's needs and wants. So it's so, so many times these people keep others' uh, needs, if not before them, but at least they respect their needs as much as they respect their own personal needs. Right? It's very easy to work with these people. They don't have any hidden, hidden agendas. They don't have their own ads to grind, right? And the other, the fourth characteristic which makes trust thrive between people is candor, right? Candor means someone's capacity to act with honesty, integrity, keep one's promise and not use deceit in any kind of uh, interaction or transaction, right? So you can trust people uh, when you feel, again, uh, when you know that they are honest, when you know that they'll keep up their promises, right? They will not fail you. That's very, very important. So look for these four capacities or capabilities in other people and start developing these capabilities or capacities within you for you to be, uh, be someone who could be trusted by others, right? So here are the four pillars of trust. The first pillar of trust is expertise, right? That is maintaining through knowledge of the subject and your capacity to communicate what you know in very simple, very lucid, very clear language, right? Expertise. People will trust you because they know you're an authority in your field. They know that your opinion or your expertise matters in that. I was just reading in the paper yesterday that after the disaster that Himachal has went through, government of Himachal has collaborated with a, with French experts to understand the sensitive ecology of the hill state and uh, get into a more sustainable civil development, um, learning from the mistakes of the past, right? So this company was shortlisted because they must have proven their expertise in this particular field. Second is goodwill, which is also called as reputation. Let me tell you, goodwill or reputation is something that travels to any place before you do. It gets teleported, isn't it? People know you by the reputation you have generated in your professional and personal circles. And, to, and this is the way to create the reputation. Be knowledgeable, be reliable, we are caring, 
and a considerate person and have the honesty and the integrity to practice uh, whatever you have promised, right? So when it comes to goodwill, um, sharing and being open and being transparent and being consistent is something that helps. The third pillar of trust is reliability, right? So it is about someone's ability to, 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 to rely on you, right? They know that you will not fail them. And the fourth one is called as authenticity, which is in sync with being an integrated, honest, true, authentic kind of a human being, right? So these are the four aspects of trust which makes people in an organization very strong pillars, very strong supporters of one, their own cells, two, of people around them, right? And you all know it, why does trust matter? Trust matters because it makes you feel safe. And when you're feeling safe, the morale and the motivation of the team is high. Uh, it uh, allows better collaboration because it's so easy to delegate a task or share the task with someone without fear of being deceited or without the apprehension of being failed um, in that task. It increased productivity and engagement because there is so much of working together. There is reliable teamwork happening, right? There is ethical decision making because people are very high on honesty and integrity. I mean, I think of Japan when I think of all this. It improves loyalty, retention. People will like to stay in an organization which provides them this kind of culture where um, there is freedom to do work and then there are colleagues who are supportive and they're ready to share your responsibilities. There is a lot of room for creativity and innovation because so much of energy which otherwise is wasted in politics showing other people down, backbiting, gaslighting, you know, the same energy is being used in generating and creating something new. There is reduced level of stress. There's hardly any um, dirty politics or hostility in that environment. Uh, people feel it is easy to change and evolve and grow in this kind of an environment because they see so much of support. They are not scared of make, making mistakes. They know they will not be shamed, right? They will not be judged if at all they falter in meeting their goals or, uh, uh, you know, uh, flawlessly accomplishing or completing some kind of a task. People feel accountable in these organizations. It's a gateway to persuasion, sharing and developing ideas, right? And definitely it increases customer satisfaction. So overall, the health of an organization will improve considerably when people within that organization are capable of trusting uh, each other and there is uh, no sense of doubt and, uh, you know, uh, that sense of disbelief that exists. Okay. Now, what would happen if the team is not able to trust each other? Or uh, what are the signs of absence of or lack of trust in a team? Now, you know, what are the causes for lack of the trust is you we don't have any team spirit. Um, there is fear of vulnerability and also there is fear of making mistakes. There's no culture. So what will people stick to? Uh, there is uh, hardly any face-to-face -face interactions because people feel intimidated in each other's presence, right? And the communication is very poor and ineffective. And because of all these things, 
people are not committed. Uh, there is a lot of conflict. And the performance of the people in the organization is very, very poor. So just see when we are not investing enough in creating a culture of trust, when we are not mindful of how we are treating each other, and you know, we are hell-bent on creating problems in each other's lives, and you know, we are obsessed with our own personal self-interest. We are cynical about other people and we are punitive in our approach. The whole culture becomes uh, maligned, isn't it? It becomes spurious and everybody, including the organization, bears the cost for it. So if you are living in a place and the water gets contaminated, you will also bear the cost of it, right? So my suggestion, a very earnest one to all of you is, Let's contribute in building a culture of trust. What is the secret formula for trust? The secret formula for trust is reliability plus likability. When you like somebody, you're able to trust that person. And also you're able to trust someone when someone shows consistency, right? So the more we increase reliability in an organization and the more we increase a culture of fondness for each other in, a, in an organization, higher would be the trust in that organization. Okay, now I'll go to this part of uh, this section of the session a little later. I intend to show a video to all of you. Let me just check if it would be possible to show you that video. Give me a moment, please. I think this little clip makes a case study. Many of you would be parents here. Bonding between mother and girl. Yeah, Benita, that's right. But how is that bonding built? Dance in a interrogation in a criticism in a acceptance say. You know, up me se baat lo teenagers ke parents honge, and uh, we are for, so frustrated most of the times. So, our children hum se baat nahi karte. They trust their friends more than they trust us. We are the reason. Hum unko interrogate hi itna karte, hum doubt itna karte unko, right? And uh, hum appreciate bhi itne hote apne bacho ke. Uh, Mindsets ko leke. Right? To build up trust, you have to have a large heart, magnanimous heart. You can't be a fault founder, fault uh, finding person all the time. You must know how to appreciate people. And the moment she hugged her and said, I don't have to ask anything, that was when the child. Um, got surprised first, because if you remember, she was saying Kiran Bedi and all those terminologies for her mother, right? But the moment mother shed her that authoritative attitude and let the child be, imagine this child, this girl, she herself opened up about whatever happened, right? I mean, a boy not liking her and she doubting about her own selves. So, अगर अपने बच्चों के साथ trust build up करना है, तो उनको judge करना छोड़ दीजिए। उनके level पे आके, उनको समझने, सब उनको समझना है, कोशिश नहीं करना है, उनको समझना है, right? जब हम teen teenagers थे, हमने भी तो बहुत सारे experiments किए। Now our children have got into that age, so we have started becoming so doubtful and apprehensive about their decision making, about their choices and all those things, right? So teen, teenage is a time when children are becoming adults. They're going through a transition phase from being children, overprotected children, to young adults who don't want parents to hover over their heads all the time, right? So sometimes you can take your parents out of the way, दोस्त वाले जूते में भी डालिए, 
राइट और उनकी दुनिया को उनकी नजर से देखने की कोशिश कीजिए लुकिंग एट समवन एल्सेस वर्ल्ड फ्रॉम देयर पर्सपेक्टिव एम्पैथाइजिंग विद देम दैट इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट राइट हम सब ह्यूमन बीइंग्स की तीन बेसिक साइकोलॉजिकल नीड्स हैं द नीड टू बी हर्ड नीड टू बी सीन एंड नीड टू बी लव्ड एंड रिस्पेक्टेड और वैल्यूड सो सोचिए अगर आपको ट्रस्ट बिल्डअप करना है ना वेदर इट्स होम योर रिलेशनशिप विद योर स्पाउस योर रिलेशनशिप विद योर चिल्ड्रन और योर रिलेशनशिप विद योर फ्रेंड्स मेक दम फील हर्ड इन अ नॉन जजमेंटल मैनर पे अटेंशन टू देम वेन दे आर टॉकिंग टू यू वेन दे आर शेयर इन दर वनरेबिलिटीज टू यू इन साइकोलॉजी से से दैट वेन पीपल शेयर वॉट इज ट्रबलिंग देम विद यू टेक ऑफ योर स्लीपर्स इट्स अ सेक्रेड मोमेंट इट्स नॉट ईजी फॉर एनी वन to bear their hearts in front of other people if they're choosing you for that imagine they must have seen that consistency they must have seen that care they must they they must have seen you worthy of it isn't it so we must work uh in relationships invest in this 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 relationship by making people make a uh, feel heard seen and valued I think this is one of the most beautiful gifts that one human being can offer to another human being. Right? And that's where the bonds get strengthened. So, I was very keen on sharing this particular aspect of trust with um all of you. Let's continue with the organizational trust. So, these are the ways to build up trust uh in our colleagues so jab bhi you need someone or you hire someone or there is somebody new who joins the organization it is very important that you clarify their roles and responsibilities to them in a very lucid and clear manner your directions have to be very clear if there is ambiguity in a relationship there cannot be a trust in that relationship right so have clarity about your expectations from others in your lives if you over expect things and people will keep falling short of your expectations and hence there will always be a tussle a tiff in the relationships right secondly before hiring or while hiring please verify the skill set of this person you may make a wrong choice while hiring and then later on uh we regret or we blame this person the problem is you did not align the skills with the description of the job and this person is not able to live up to your expectations right so not just the technical skills are to be checked but also what is what needs to be checked are the collaboration skills that is whether a particular person is capable of working with other people as a competent team member or not that's also a very important requirement right so please check rather cross check the skills of people um when you hire them of course this is more relevant to people in power and head of the departments and those ones okay and if you really want to build trust another very important element is a uh, you know meeting people in non professional setups that's also very very important even uh, uh, you know uh, see there are two things one is team building and other is team bonding right team bonding would happen when we meet each other in social contexts so uh trust building in a in an organization can happen if you have you know casual tea breaks where everybody comes together where the whole department comes together sit and chit chat so maybe from 11 to 11 15 11 30 if there is a break time or it can be created right just sit and discuss non professional things in the organization seek interest in someone else's life that is very important uh, for this person to feel valued right and uh, feel heard and 
at that time if possible if you have you know your own set of clerks or your own set of office staff even they can be included or be a part of those uh, tea breaks and uh, tea meets right this builds up trust and if it is not uh, possible to have it every day at least have it once in a month where everybody from the department gets together and uh, you know talk about things which are not related to work right to get to know more about each other's personal lives family lives right where you're providing a safe space to someone if they want to discuss something that's not okay at home with their children right so just talking casual things that is very very important okay so another important thing to build trust is as a leader please show your vulnerabilities you know as a leader hum hamesha apna success share karte hain but when you show your vulnerability as a leader uh people are able to connect better with you they are able to relate with you more right if you uh, i mean if you share your failures with your team there is a stronger connection because failure and vulnerabilities generate stronger connections than success kisi ka success hamare liye threatening ho sakta hai but common failures create a common ground for bonding utilize that power as i said earlier also your intention has to be crystal clear your communication has to be very very clear for that have one on one meetings um, you know with with your colleagues with your subordinates so that you are able to express what is your expectation from them right uh, and very important we got to live like a trusted role model reputation travels right so it is so important that you walk the talk that you do not become a preacher but a practitioner of whatever values um, you want your team and your subordinates and your colleagues to inculcate right uh, finally this is another um very interesting video about building trust we'll have a look at this video and we will close this session there do let me know if it's audible we survey ceos police officers truck drivers cooks engineers if people are working we've surveyed them and what we know in terms of their happiness workers all want the same things there's 3 billion working people in the world and about 40% of them would say they're happy at work that means about 1.8 billion or almost 2 billion people are not happy at work what does that do both to those people and the organizations that they work in. Well, let's talk about money. Organizations that have a lot of happy employees have three times the revenue growth compared to organizations where that's not true. They outperform the stock market by a factor of 3. And if you look at employee turnover, it's half that of organizations that have a lot of unhappy employees. The miracle thing is, you don't have to spend more money to make this happen. It's not about ping pong tables and massages and pet walking. It's not about the perks. It's all about how they're treated by their leaders and by the people that they work with. So, I'd like to share a few ideas that create happy employees. Idea number one: in organizations where employees are happy, what you find is two things are present: trust and respect. Leaders often say, "We trust our employees. We empower our employees." And then, when an employee needs a laptop, and this is a true example, fifteen people have to approve that laptop. So, for the employee. All the words are right, but 15 levels of approval for a $1500 laptop, you've actually spent more money than the laptop on the approval, and the employee feels maybe they're really not trusted. So what can an organization do to have a high level of trust? The first organization that comes to mind is Four Seasons. They have magnificent properties all around the world, and their employees are told, "Do whatever you think is right when servicing the customer." to hand that trust to your employees to do whatever they think is right makes the employees feel great and this is why they're known for delivering some of the best service in the world idea number 2 fairness the thing that erodes trust in our organization faster than anything else is when employees feel that they're being treated unfairly employees want to be treated the same regardless of their rank or their tenure or their age or their experience or their job category compared to anyone else When I think about great organizations who get fairness right, the first organization that comes to mind is Salesforce. 
they found that men and women working in the same job with the same level of proficiency were making different amounts of money. So immediately they calculated the difference and they invested $3 million to try and balance things out. Idea number three is listening. So to be a listener who connects with all types of people, we have to unlearn a few things. We've all been taught about active listening and eye contact and intense stare and a compassionate look. That's not listening. Repeating what the person says, that's not listening. Being humble and always hunting and searching for the best idea possible, that's what listening is. And employees can feel whether you're doing that or not. They want to know when they talk to you and share an idea, did you consider it when you made a decision? The one thing that everybody appreciates and wants when they're speaking is to know that what they say matters so much, you might actually change your mind. Otherwise, what's the point of the conversation? We all know the things we need to change, the things that we need to do differently. The way you behave, the way you treat others, the way you respond, the way you support defines the work experience for everyone around you. Changing to be a better person, the world is littered with those failures. But changing because there's something you believe in, some purpose that you have, where you're willing to risk almost everything because it's so important to you. That's the reason to change. If it's not, you should probably find a different place to work. Okay, so these are the small things that are very important, very essential to build up a culture of trust in the organization. And as I said yesterday also, the buck stops at you. We have to change certain things. We need to introduce certain things, modify certain behaviors, if we want to bring about a larger change in our society, right? So that's.